Hello world, and welcome back to Practicing Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. My name's Sarah, and I'm here with my friend Lizelle, and today we're going to be talking about episode 29, which is called Getting to the Depths of Relevance Realization. So, as I always do, we'll pass it over to Lizelle to get us started with a quote. Hello world. Yes, we're going deep today. Deeper still. I'm starting us again with Plato from Alcibiades again, Alcibiades 1. Um, it's on my screen, so hence I'm reading like this. Um, Alcibiades says, I entirely believe you, Socrates, but what are the sorts of pains which are required? Can you tell me? Socrates, yes, I can. But we must take counsel together concerning the manner in which both of us may be most improved. For what I am telling you of the necessity of education applies to myself as well as to you. And there is only one point in which I have an advantage over you. Alcibiades. And what is it? Socrates. I have a guardian who is better and wiser than your guardian, Pericles. Alcibiades. Who is he, Socrates? Socrates. God, Alcibiades, who up to this day has not allowed me to converse with you, and he inspires in me the faith that I am especially designed to bring you to honour. Alcibiades. You are jesting, Socrates playing like a child, the Greek is. Socrates, perhaps, at any rate, I am right in saying that all men greatly need pains and care, and you and I above all men. Alcibiades, you are not far wrong about me, Socrates, and certainly not about myself, Alcibiades. But what can we do? Socrates. There must be no hesitation or cowardice, my friend. Alcibiades. That would not become us, Socrates. Socrates. No, indeed. And we ought to take counsel together. For do we not wish to be as good as possible? Hmm. I like that. What made you pick that one? What led you to that one? Uh, it's the top one. <laughs> it's, and it ironically, or by coincidence, really fits well with what I picked to end with. Um, so when I'm reading the the, the the platonic text in the morning, if there's something that jumps out to me, I put it on this to read with Sarah list. Oh, nice. And this is the top one. That being said, I mean, we were talking about how we're really going to, this is painful, what we're doing now. We're going through a painful part of the awakening series, for both of us at least, for because we don't have the cognitive science back, backgrounds. And so this is, we're struggling. I mean, you talked about five minutes, taking a break to process, five minutes, to, and me, myself as well, even though it's the third time that I go through this, I had to literally pause sometimes and just sit and literally massage my head. Yeah. So we're taking great pains, but what is the purpose? Why are we doing this? Yeah. Yeah, it is. This one and in getting into the cognitive science, it's brain bending. And there's this, um, I don't know, normal way I think, or huh, now it's normal, the standard way of learning which is, you even see it, cliff notes, spark notes. What's the gist of it? Just give me the, the, the essence. Like, what, is the, what, is this, what does this come down to? And this isn't, this isn't a, something that you can learn that way. This isn't even something you can grasp or put your finger on that way. You literally have to get to the depth. So it was funny, we were mentioning, because we always use the cave diving analogy. And with this one, I mentioned to you that enriched air or the nitrox when you're going deeper into diving and that almost is like a good um, model for what it feels like. It's like 
wait, we weren't trained to use the nitrix. <laughs> so there's that whole other level of training that you have to go through. And there's just like a whole different, there's a whole different list of things to be fearful of once you get to those depths. And, you know, it's nice because the nitrix helps you to stay down for prolonged periods of time. And it allows you to do less, you know, coming back up to the surface. But it still comes with a lot of problems, too, that are, yeah, difficult to navigate. And one of those being, like, you have to take your own light. <laughs> like, there's a lot of things down there. You've always got to be with your buddy, you know, and knowing where the line is. Maybe the line drifts off and it's harder to get back. So at least I need to know where my buddy is at all times. And taking those breaks, it, because you have longer at the bottom, then it's, it, there's not this like frantic grab at things and I don't have to, you know, get through this episode. It's like, no, I'm just going to stay down here now that I have more time and or I'm giving myself more time to actually process it, let it sit and not try to, you know, logically understand it even, contemplate it and allow it to just marinate. And this is very clearly causing shifts in my mind I almost don't know what to do with at this point. There are shifts that are happening. My salience landscape is shifting in a way that I don't have the ability to make sense of how that's happening, what the repercussions of that are, or even what's shifting. It's just like, uh, and I was telling you about this and hopefully maybe I can find the video of this guy who's- I'm not even kidding, but I'm just fucking sliding doing fucking hell on my ass. Got it quite a face like. Fucking hell. <laughs> and that is what the salient landscape shift feels like right now. <laughs> mentioned previously that he was backwards <laughs> <laughs> sliding backwards down it <laughs> so getting into uh review first wow what a great you know outlined like this looked nice the way that he did this review of reviewing the real relevance realization and then using that for a naturalistic explanation of relevance realization to build into a plausibility argument I was thinking about uh, your words, um, uh, also that we need to be able to, if we want to feel like we understand it, and this one I don't necessarily feel like I understand it. So I was trying to find a way, like, well, well to tell, to convince myself, well, I kind of get the the, the 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 basics of what he's trying to do here, and then it's very simple. Um, he, he goes through the review again, which is like we we fought last time. He's been bringing in these uh, convergence element, like say in the last time I did the convergence element to why relevance realization is the centrality of the issue of relevance realization is the words that he used. But then this this whole episode is about him saying, okay, there are different theories about relevance realization. I'm going to run you through free and all free I'm going to show you how they are not plausible we need more mm -hmm. we need a different theory and they all free aren't you know usable for the same reason they use circular argumentation and then indeed he goes into the different theories and he he, he has a lot of information in this episode which is why it feels so overwhelming Mm -hmm. but that's the basic basic thing of this that what he's trying to convey and uh, yeah and why he has so much information is what you said uh, he's trying to illustrate how one does science how one thinks through pro problems he doesn't want to give because i told you like i was like john just give me the answer like i trust you just give me the answer and if you say this is the right theory or this is not the right theory, I'll believe you. But he doesn't want us to just take his word for it. He wants to show us this is why I, I'm saying what I'm saying. 
and then also show us how we can better, you know, think through things ourselves. I mean, I hear you saying, I would, I, I would just trust John, obviously, like, so would I, because, God, we come through all this with him, so, like, <laughs> right now, like, yeah, I, I have... I have an understanding of my relationship and my mind's relationship with his content. And I know that I, I find it to be compelling. And so if I'm trying to articulate that to someone else, I'll just be like, just listen to John. And they're like, but I don't, I don't know who he is. This is, who is that guy? You know, some, some bloke, you know, just off the street. Who's John? So there needs to be more substance to my description of this in order for me to have that same level of of you know i don't know um substance it's it, it would be more adequate if i could say why i think these things as opposed to just being like because john said so <laughs> and i mean honestly that is me a lot of the times i'll just be like look i'm referencing john verbeke he's a cognitive scientist out of the university of toronto and like i'll give the whole thing because because I mean, I did learn that from John too, is to reference your sources. So I do that a lot, but it would be nice if I could just speak from my own experience with the content to say, I understand it to the d level, the depth that I can tell you why I, I believe this to be closer to the truth than we have gotten, you know, with, with just uh, self-help books, you know? There is something pr the pre self help <laughs> that you're getting to here. That is really excellently uh, an excellent way to step into even further because he he start or he makes a, a comment at a certain point like why is it does it matter how we do relevance realization why does it matter why it's uh, so central and then he goes on to say that the the elegance part will show that it's so well relevant <laughs> <laughs> it's so important it feeds into maybe i should put it feeds into our spirituality our search for wisdom our our search for meaning cool intro well we took longer to have our introduction than john did for once <laughs> okay so the, this series of arguments then shall we begin should we give the uh the three up front or should we just go in order let's do what he did we yep. mentioned the three and then we discussed three separately okay so beginning then with the three that we're going to cover as far as a series of arguments for why this yeah is actually inadequate these three are the theories of relevance like how uh, what is relevance and these are the three that is like popular or going around type of thing, which I is see. now going to I'm just going to give the, the words that he put up there. So the first one, representations. The second one is computation. And then the third one's modularity. So let's go into representations. What do you have? I have a lot of really small written words. Because <laughs> at this stage, I was still trying to figure, fit it in in the space that I allowed for it. The mental entity that stands for an object in the world, that's the representation. And this is the semantic level, although we only get to it later. Mm -hmm. So we form representations in our minds of actual objects in the world. And that directs us toward the object in the world or the entity, this representation directs us towards that. There's something reciprocal about that too like the object to which you are focusing that mental entity towards is actually pulling you towards that in the physical space in this. So they, there was something mentioned too about this having like that, that connection of the mental to the real world. This representation allows for that. There's some sort of connection now with what's happening in here and the, what's out there. Because why is it relevant? That's the question. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is then the answer that they give. Uh -huh, Aha, yeah. yeah. So how do we explain relevance? They say through this representation, this theory of representations, or with this, the cause of, you know, this, our use of representations. And mm -hmm. then they, what that you said. 
Yeah. Wow. It's interesting. Like, yeah, relevance is important because of relevance. <laughs> relevance is important because of relevance. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But he does go in, into detail about what exactly this theory, these theories ent entails. At least the first two, he goes into quite a lot of detail. Then he takes it apart. And there's, I, I also had a feeling there's a lot of these things that's actually really important to get for future purposes. I mean, he said explicitly this when I talk about the aspects, you should take note of it. We're going to come back to it. So it's not just that he's giving, you know, info, extra information um, to illustrate how one should think, but he's also dropping in seeds for future, uh, mm -hmm. for future um, conversations. When I finally read this book, uh, and he talks about different ways of knowing and that the one is before language, the intuitive knowing, and the one is after language. And um, I feel like with this episode, I'm still lacking because what we're supposed to do is take the intuitive knowledge and put it into language and then, you know, go deeper from there. But I feel with this episode, a lot of our knowledge is still very intuitive. And that's why we're struggling for words. Yep. Oh, here it is. The annoyer, as it is used in the dialogues, is something like discursive reasoning. So that is actually being able to speak it. For our purposes and for the contrast with noesis, its crucial characteristic is that it's articulated thinking or reasoning. Noesis, by contrast, is typically translated as intuition or insight. I feel like we're fencing something of great importance in this episode. Underneath the depths, because what I the, the 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 synopsis I gave is the surface. I, I showed you the surface, and we, there's something in the depths that's really significant, and we both feel it. Mm -hmm. But we're still struggling very much. Yeah. With the do 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 and work part. That comes to mind, and then something completely different. Um, I I was thinking maybe the the purpose of the the one who reads or interprets the oracle, because I know you don't like to refer to yourself as the oracle, you, you listen to the oracle, mm -hmm. is exactly that, to point, to make salient or relevant to others, which they don't see otherwise. Yeah, that's exactly, I mean, again, chills running through my body all morning this morning, but that is exactly it, it is. I tell people often, and this was with supplements too, what I'm doing is letting you borrow my brain. These are the things that I have accumulated. And sometimes I don't have a way of just like presenting it. No, I just, I know things about them. And if you ask me questions, then that helps because that digs it out of me. What is relevant to you? And maybe I can even shift the relevance. These folks are saying that you need this as a cofactor. And those are like things, those are little little tips and, and things that I've picked up along the way. But I wouldn't just be able to offer all of the information that I have to people because it's just overwhelming. There's just way too much. So I need to be able to field the question and that's almost like the finger. That's their finger <laughs> saying, what do I want to know? And then I can be like, okay, good, here. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that we can go into the fencing phenomenon. Yeah, it's, it's finger of instantiation. So this was Zenon Plishin, the author of the book that he mentions in this one, I guess. I ordered those that book two times, and both times it just wasn't delivered. But luckily I do pay on delivery, so I never had to pay, but still. So that the experiment, I guess, just briefly is that uh, you have people tracking multiple objects and the idea here, or I guess the finding was that the more things that you track, the less features of those things that you can attribute to each of the individual uh, things that you are tracking. Objects. Yeah. Which, Which I totally find... makes sense, right? No. No. Oh. No, it makes absolutely no sense to me. Oh, I just it's... thought like my brain only has so much capacity to like work at all. And so if it's allocating more fingers, I guess you could say, out and trying to keep all of those. 
I mean, I think about like all the disciplines that I try to study and how I can't get to any of them in depth. I'm a generalist. I am not a specialist. So that's how that was why it made sense to me. But I'm interested to hear why. Okay. Yeah. On that level, it, it makes sense. I, I mean, I get it, but I'm like, I've, I think it's, it's, it's actually, if you sit and think about it, it's a mind blowing phenomenon because in my mind is, okay, I need to keep track of the red uh, X, right? Somehow I keep track of it, even though it turns into mm -hmm. a blue square. So it changes. Okay. I didn't know this part. Well, my mind, like, it makes logical sense for, for what I would think is, okay, you kind of have an overview of the whole and at the end you quickly look and, oh, there's the red X. But that's not how it works. You actually keep track of it even though it changes. You don't even notice it changes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. That I mean, you know, I don't think that that part was like really in depth with his description. I don't, I, or I just didn't grasp that. He does say it, but but I've heard about this experiment. They are, the, it's, it's like the, 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 the gorilla experiment. Have you heard about that experiment? Mm -hmm. So what they do is they have people, um, they have two basketball teams, and then they have them throw the ball to each other. And then they say to have people, the test is you have to count how many times does the red team catch the ball. In the midst of this, they have like a guy dressed up as a gorilla walk past. And people are so consumed by tracking the ball that they don't even see the gorilla. And it's not even like the gorilla is just like boo -boo 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 -boo, off the screen. It was like dancing. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> like trying to get your attention, but you're just like one, two, three. <laughs> so hypnotized by the ball that you don't see this damn person dressed up as a gorilla right there in the screen. Yeah, it's crazy. Which is a very different experiment, I know, but I had to think of that. But like, it means we track yearness and nowness. That is what he says. But what the fuck is that actually? Really? If you yearness nowness, if you think about that, it's not the the red X. It's that thing, which completely changed into something else. But I somehow I kept track of its movements. Mm -hmm. I would think the mind works like, like I said, like after everything's moved, you, your mind quickly, your eyes quickly go to the red X and oh, there it is. But we actually track yearness and nowness. I think that's astounding. That's, yeah. that's, that's like, wow. You know, yeah. I think that's just, wow. Yeah. That, that, that we're capable of doing that. I mean, do and we that. don't notice that it changed. That's also so weird. Yeah. But maybe because it's a lot of objects, so you're not focused necessarily on on what it is. Yeah. It's redness or squareness. You're, you're just on its yearness and nowness you're focused on. Yeah. But it's so amazing, just that. Like, I think I could probably spend the rest of my life just studying that phenomena of how do we track yearness and nowness. Or, or maybe I'm seeing more into it than it is. But it sounds to me, it sounds like a capability that's just amazing that we seem to have it's, it's like we, we, we're almost oblivious to change if it happens if it happens and it's not the focus of our attention if the right. change is that that might be something connected yeah. I don't know I want to know more about this eventually yeah uh, my uh, my ex what I thought was amazing was he's, he's very dry humor I, I just love it and very cynical type of thing so what he did is for for years like a period of i don't know how many years he kept newspaper clippings of the same thing and then tracking how people's opinions change and how how it's reported like at a certain point everybody's like whoa this is like and and nobody note you don't notice how public opinion changes on a certain thing mm -hmm. if you don't keep track and and the same newspaper he that was his whole thing i'm going to stick to the same newspaper yeah. and see how they change so it's yeah it's it's crazy how yeah we don't keep track of changes apparently but i think that's a different phenomenon yeah yeah my mind can keep in touch it's tracking the here-ness and now-ness and he says salience tagging is another way that he likes to describe this of here-ness and now-ness so so that idea of tagging is interesting too it's like mm. Yeah, putting a... and I think that's where the the idea, the memory of the the gorilla experiment. If we tag something, we seem to be oblivious to everything else. 
but I like the fact that we can keep in touch with reality. He, he uses the words of fundamental connectedness to reality. Oh my God. But then I have to immediately ask, but really? <laughs> Same machinery. There's that also demonstrative reference that he's uh, summoned here. And he's saying that the demonstrative reference is needed before categorizing things. So I think this was when he started to mention how we categorize things and find them relevant. So maybe that's like the tagging, like, okay, I've mm. put this into that category. I've tagged it this. My, mm. And that categorization depends on the demonstrative reference. Mm. So it's like, he's like, so this is the argument is, all concepts are categorical, but categorizations depend on something that is pre-categorical. And yeah, what is it? What is that pre-categorical thing that it depends upon? Relevance, because we categorize things according to their relevance. As we, last time we talked about logical categorizations, which is often not really how we do it. We mostly do it psychological. Like mm -hmm. he talked about, like uh, fire, my 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 partner, my children, artwork gasoline those types of things all of a sudden becomes a category yes psychologically so we we have that circular thing where the thing that we try to use to explain something so all of a sudden is staring itself back in the eye and like oh wait i'm just i'm just saying ice cream tastes like ice cream yeah <laughs> yeah what I have written here is initial salience tagging. It's like the mind being in contact with the world. So there's that, the, the thing that we can know is that there is still contact with the world, but even if I, so like me describing ice cream is tasting like ice cream. It's like, I'm trying to say more, but that's the problem. So that because is- the, he, he then yeah. refers to the fact that um, this hearness and nowness is very present in uh, altered state of consciousness for people. And that is exactly ineffable. That is the ineffability yes. of. So that which is most, almost as if that which we which we are, the deepest, capable of getting in touch with. Which is what I just read from the other book is the least capable of being put in words. The well, and also I mean more than just like because it would be nice to be able to share that with someone what it is that I'm experiencing. There is profound there's the profound sense of meaning. So it's like when, okay, cause like my meaning is probably only meaningful if it's if it's seen as being meaningful, you know, not to get into another circle, but, but we were talking earlier about the kind of perception of me living with my family, for instance, you know, like from the, from the perspective of, of someone, you know, somebody else, especially somebody in my, culture you know i'm i'm not succeeding i'm not doing very well um and therefore maybe i don't have a sense of meaning you know for, and so from if i'm to take on that mindset then yeah i feel like i'm not nothing that i'm doing is very meaningful but i know that what i'm doing is very meaningful i know that the past three years that i've spent with my man, my family is very meaningful and it, i will never regret having done this so in order for me to have a sense of value for myself then I need to be able to find meaning in what it is that I'm doing. Something that is so ingrained that I, I don't even think I can articulate that, why that's so important for me to have meaning in order for me to, you know, continue on. But it is, it's... We, we will come back to that again, I think. Um, because a book that was uh, um, recommended in the past, which I didn't get to then, which is recommended in a couple of episodes to come, is meaning in life and why it matters. But see, exactly that. Exactly that is my, my, but how do we share it? How do we communicate it? Because there is a different, and I think that's what you, you're, you're saying as well. There's a, there's a different, we feel more sane when what we experience can be shared and validated by others. Mm -hmm. And we feel there's there's a certain comfort in the professionals being able to put it in words. Right. 
And okay. actually, we can we can very much connect it to the past episodes of the Awakening series, because what happened to us from the scientific viewpoint, we went from being connected to all of reality to coming smaller and smaller, smaller spaces until it's only just this head of ours that we are able to connect with. And then only this head of ours in this instant, because memories that what it's not, it's gone. So I think that's what we're, what I'm, what we're here, like how we need, yes, it's meaningful to have that experiences, but we also need it to be, get out of just here. Mm -hmm. It can't just stay here. We need that connection in order for it to be real, yeah. more real, more meaningful. Yeah. I think that's what we're, so yeah, we're doing a review unintentionally, <laughs> but I think that's, that's what it, that's what we're picking up here. It, it, it needs to connect back. It needs to connect back yeah. to all the things that we've yeah. gone to, to make it whole. Yeah. This is a whole culminating yeah. message because now all those strings that were being launched into the future are finding an anchor point. Yeah. And it's strong further into the, the next. Yeah. Like I've, I've said it this before. John is a genius. If for no other reason, how well this, this, this whole se series is put together because you see the parts in the whole and the whole in the parts. Exactly. And that is just a platonic masterpiece. Yeah. That's, well, so would you like to consider the computational level of relevance realization at the syntactic level? Because we just went through the semantic level and how words often fail us. And that is why dialogos is so important. Mm -hmm. Because we, it gets us to places where we couldn't have been on our own, gotten yeah. to on our own. So the semantic is that representations are, yeah, they're just inadequate and he says that semantic is how terms refer to how terms refer to the real to the world. Yeah. Now we're moving into syntax because now we're going to look into computation. So syntax is how terms have been used, how terms have to be coordinated together in some kind of system. So for instance, rules. There was that whole thing about you know, basically like math was the end all be all. It was like math is describing reality. That's it. And this next philosopher that John mentions, Fodor, is actually a defender of that model, but he did have the humility to criticize it even and say, still inadequate. There, there's a distinction between implications and inference is what I gathered. The way I understand it, I'm not sure that implication relates to the rules. That's how I understand it. And inference, um, it's inference is what you infer, of course, when you're actually using an implication to change your beliefs. Mm -hmm. So you infer something and then you change your beliefs. Okay, I like how you said that though, the um, implications, it's, it's like the implications are the rules and then the inference is how you use those rules in order to change the beliefs. I got that too. That's kind of what I gathered. Okay. All right. And then he speaks about inference first. Yeah. Cause the question there was, but what beliefs should I be changing? Mm. So, and I think this is the, when he speaks about this book, right? I'm not sure. I think this is when he speaks about this book because the, the I, I actually read this one all to the end. The other one I haven't read to the end yet. And, um, this, uh, he speaks a lot about how <clears throat> our beliefs have a lot of implications, and that comes here. And we don't always keep in mind all the implications from our beliefs. We're not aware of the fact that me believing a certain thing implies something. Any proposition is defined by the implication relations. So I think that was really cool because we're about to go through the four Ps. That was like a super cool surprise yeah. that I wasn't expecting. Yeah. Um, so the issue is that the number of relationships is combinatorial explosion again. So that we were saying earlier that the implications is our relationship with those rules. And then they're going to help us orient ourselves to this, to be aware of which beliefs maybe we should be changing. Is this where he talks about being kind? I, I think this is where he talks about being kind, like you can have, a rule which seems very simple, but if you think about it, 
you'll have like you'll need volumes in order to just write, write on how exactly to be kind in what which situation yeah um and it's just combinatorially explosive and th it's important that that i learn how to say that word because the fact that things are combinatorially explosive is kind of what makes relevance realization so important and yep. how this one then this is how this this computation argument or theory comes back to look itself in the eye and say, oh, wait, we're explaining relevance through that relevance. And I'm going to go even a step further. Okay, so now we know that the combinatorial explosion is kind of the issue. That's why the relevance realization is so important. And the energy that it takes to commit to the um, proposition is energy that I'm expending. So he mentions that we, because we can't compre be comprehensively logical is the mm. sentence that he says we cannot be comprehensively logical because there's so many different things that's that combinatorial mm. explosion there's a cognitive commitment which beliefs do i need to change in this context because there's going to be energy expended on that mm. i'm going to be using some of me so it's important for me because that commitment there's energy being put into that commitment yeah his exact words i thought it was Beautiful. Commitment is an act that makes use of our precious and limited resources of attention, time, memory, and metabolic energy. John always thanks us at the end of these episodes for our time and attention. He should also, in this one, is definitely thank us for our memory and our metabolic energy because <laughs> <laughs> this one took a lot of memory and metabolic energy and still we didn't get quite there. Um, I, I, I told you before but I think I said that off recording that I really like this guy's sense of humor or maybe it's just me reading something in because he talks about that a lot as well about how our, our resources are limited mm -hmm. and the way he usually explains how if we try to you know look logically at all the options mm -hmm. he always says like um, you you wouldn't want to do that if you are not suicidal and right. I just think that's that's funny, but but it's that's exactly it. because what will happen is you will be so frozen in the spot going through like the little robot that exploded. Yep. I, it was coming to my mind the whole time you were yeah. saying it. The little robot, yeah, yeah, because you're just so, going to stand there frozen, and yeah. <laughs> you'll yeah. blow up with the bomb that's sitting next to you. Yeah, yeah, or the tiger that's running away, or whatever, yeah. or just. And we yeah. all know this because, okay, that's what tactical training is for. Now I've watched a video. This man had fallen through ice and he was trying to teach people what to do in that situation. And he, and he drops and then <gasps> you gasp. That's your initial response. Your body is naturally going to gasp. So if you are underwater, you're dead. And if you didn't have that oh. forethought, so the whole thing is when you fall through, spread your arms out. That way your arms don't fall through. You get caught and that <gasps> is going to be above water. So that's the first thing. Then... <sighs> start breathing because you got to really get through this this moment of shock your body is now shocked by the cold not only did you just drop and you're confused but now your body is trying to deal with the fact that half of you is submerged so now what do you do breathe sit there and breathe who who in their right mind okay now i need to breathe now i need to breathe and then what's the next thing i'm going to do push up no if you push on that ice that you just fell through you're just going to fall through more so what does he say you start kicking your legs you kick your legs until you're parallel with the ice and then you can get up and scooch you just scooch forward and and don't try to get up there either because the ice is still too thin now who's thinking all of these things logically as you're in the midst of the situation nobody that's why you got to know it ahead of time you need to know all the steps because then they're going to become very relevant when you're in the ice <laughs> so yeah the and there there is like the rule of i don't know i don't want to be hypothermic i don't want to you know, freeze to death. So that general rule of I don't want to freeze to death comes in, but it's like, hey, not as relevant as I don't want to drown. Yeah. Because there's this thing about, okay, once I get out of water, then I got to worry about hypothermia. But right now in this moment, here, here, now, now, <laughs> what's the most important thing is I need to get out of the water, but I need to do it in a way where I'm not drowning. I hope I never need that information, but thank you for sharing. <laughs> so there's skill. There's skill in this step. We're moving out of the propositional language of categories or rules and into the procedural language of having the skill for that, the skill of judgment for when to use this rule or how to use this rule. Mm. The skill of relevance realization. I'm wondering now, 
because in a future episode he will talk about the fact that intelligence or IQ is fixed, but rationality is not, so we can train our rationality. I'm wondering now if relevance realization relates to, because he sometimes hints here that relevance realization links to intelligence, right? But it seems like we can train our relevance realization and then it will better relate or maybe also relate to rationality. Because if it's a skill, you can improve it, right? Right. Yeah. I'm looking forward to those episodes. And then he gets into the four Ps, which I was also like, oh, something I know. And then said in a way that I haven't heard it before. Of course, I've heard it before because I watched this before, but now really listening because I know it. And it, oh, finally, I could mentally breathe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually good because I fell into the ice in this episode. And now I could. <laughs> It Good took a couple point. of breaths, but now we're starting to realize I'm above water. <laughs> <laughs> or I have the nitrix to get through this. I can I can stay down a little longer. Okay. Okay, all right. So we can't use rules because the procedural skills are relevant. The procedural skill is relevance realization. The propositional depends on the procedural. Now, what am I talking about with procedural? Do I mean the skill of judgment is that the procedural well i have in brackets the skill of re relevance realization that so so but, but that's very um that's why i think he made you used it in an example because an example is easier here otherwise it remains abstract yeah. so the rule is be kind but how am i kind in yeah. which situation and that takes procedural knowledge that mm -hmm. you need to have the skill of being being kind because you need to apply it in different situations differently. So the skill of applying the rule. How do I apply the rule? What is relevant in this situation for it, in regards to this rule? Yeah. What is relevant? Yeah, yeah. Because the proposition was the rule. But then there's even a more need for relevance realization in that even if I have the rule, I have to know how to apply the rule. So it's like, yeah. find the rule, but it's still not enough. No. Yeah. Yeah, there's still a level of relevance realization that's underneath that even. Yeah. One of these books, I think it might be this one that talks about like uh, uh, the, the mother of all Torahs type of thing and how how uh, if if we don't have relevance realizing or if we don't have this the skill of knowing how to apply, um, we will need like, you know, this like mother of Torahs, like telling us what to do exactly. And, and that's just not possible. And that's, that's why we are adaptive in a very highly adaptive species, because we have this skill of knowing how to in different situations. Yeah. And situations keeps changing. So there's, a, there's even a deeper skill then of changing according to even though you're in a situation that you've never been in before there's something mm -hmm. that teaches you how to now apply the skill could that be the perspective or knowing i don't know that feels more like the participation now you have a model for how this entity would behave and it's mm -hmm. no longer just the rule he gave me you know mm -hmm. do unto others as you would like done unto you cool know thyself great <laughs> but but to get to the perspective of that individual really helps to field the situations. Okay, now this is what I do in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah, you, the, it's written here situational awareness is perspectival knowing. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had situational awareness. Exercising a skill depends on situational awareness. It's perspectival knowing. And he mentions the lion. So I like that one. The lion's judgment will be different even if they spoke the language. They have completely different procedures and perspectivals. Yeah. And that's a thing. Like there's a famous one about a bat as well. We have no idea what it's like being a bat. Like that's more what it is. It's like our lives are so different our way of being is so different that even if we could put in words that we can understand the words and it's he speak, the lion speaks as well as christopher master pietro we will still not understand them how is my salience landscaping foregrounding what's most relevant 
the agent and arena need to be well fitted in order for our salience landscaping to function properly. And thus the perspectival is dependent on the participatory. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still playing with that whole idea of from what exactly is that change? Okay, so we have the rule mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then we have the skill to apply the rule, which is procedural. And then we have a different situational awareness. It, it needs to be applied differently in different situations, perspectival knowing. And then we have this agent arena. So in this, this, this place, I act um, in this way. Uh, and that is participatory knowing. I'm wondering if that participatory knowing affords us to act appropriately in unknown places, or if, is there maybe another knowing underneath that? Mm. Uh, mm. What, 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 is, what is that knowing that you it throws you in a completely unknown arena? So you, you're an agent that you've never encountered before because you, th this agent has never been in that arena, mm -hmm. and yet you know how to act. Yeah. The, the skills, the relevant skills, the re relevant perspective, or the, way, the relevant way to participate, comes yeah. to you, you have that, or you, you are that is probably a better way to, what is that? That that ability is, finesse comes to mind, but then it must be a very deep finesse. <laughs> Maybe that is wisdom though, right? Maybe wisdom is that ability to actually embody all the different ways of knowing. I do think you're onto something because I mean, before we were having this discussion, I mentioned to you how experience allows these things to adhere to something like concepts can adhere to something with experience, which is something that young people lack. They don't have the experience to adhere concepts to. So what I'm thinking, for instance, like we had a concert uh, at the garden the other night. And I mean, it's like one of these like, um, chill spiritual kind of things and i don't know why i had a little gremlin in my head that asked what would happen if i just broke that guitar for no reason at all absolutely no reason i just thought it i thought it was like sitting somewhere where it shouldn't be sitting and it, and like what if i just went up and just like boom and just broke it like how would these people respond and i just kind of like played with that in my head because they're all very spiritual like would they be like peace and blessings be upon you what is what is happening you know like <laughs> are you okay like I don't know why my mind just thought because it was it was also alluding back to kind of like whatever his name diogenes and like just being totally inappropriate and like out of control and like who does that make me now what am i in that kind of a side note but not like this very much illustrates the interrelation interrelatedness of all the ways of knowing i think and he did say in this episode, like, he didn't want to draw the, he, he, like, drew the lines, but then he was like, but I'm not doing that. That's not what I'm doing here. But they all affect each other. But in that kind of way where you need this one in order to have this one in order to have that one. And so, yeah. I think that's a lot of things that went wrong with religion. Um, yeah. uh, and I think that's kind of Kierkegaard's point as well, that when you're born into a religion, you're born into the propositions. And you don't have that grounding up relationship to it necessarily. You could have it if, if you're generally you know, participating. But oftentimes it stays on the level of propositions. And that is so shallow and so meaningless. Ooh. And I mean, because I was telling you, like, before we went into this episode, I wanted to reference back in my notes to what John had said about Hobbes. And so I mm -hmm. just wanted to see which episode it was so all i did was typed in awakening from the meaning crisis hobbs so that it would tell me which episode and what pulled up was an adify app which is an app that goes through a video and will give you the spark notes or the cliff notes and even with little emojis to kind of catch your attention and like all this kind of stuff and i was like i was wondering like is that good because people are gonna suspect that they have a full understanding even though they only have a shallow dip of their toe into the actual content if they're mm -hmm. just reading through cliff notes and i think that is actually the most important part to actually yeah. talk about this yeah because then you're already integrating it then you have to put words together i mean we struggle through this speaking yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think it's, it's actually quite cool that we, this was the first episode that we didn't speak through first 
yeah so there's something too like watching it watching it in a way where you're taking notes down and then watching it in a way where you want to be able to participate in it to speak it not just for it to be uh propositions not even for it to just be like what would john do yeah. it's now uh we're in it participating yeah. in it and we're we're like constructing videos from it so in that way we're kind of like in relationship with it too our ours conversations are in relationship with that conversation mm -hmm. And people who only watch or read those um, those uh, synoptic uh, uh, AI generated syn synopsis things um, will never appreciate John's very complex relationship to cats. Right. Like, okay. Would you like to get into modularity then? Because we have to spend so much time on this one that I think we should definitely start getting into. <laughs> Jump in, Sarah. Jump in. I know. Okay, so modularity does not spend any time on. This is a complete homuncular theory. And yeah. so I appreciated the fact that he was just like, let's just chalk it off to that's a circular yeah. explanation. Um, basically, for the cognitive scientists, it seems like the central executive is this god. <laughs> so does God you speak of. He's the yeah. central executive of the mind. But really, John says the homuncular theory comes back in because they're literally just like, yes, mind. And then there's this central executive in it. And it's like, so what does that mm -hmm. central executive do? Well, I mean, he has the capacity for, I, I say he even, it has the capacity for relevance realization. It's like, yeah. mm, interesting. So what again yeah. does it do? <laughs> yeah. It's exactly the homuncular explanation and they could have calling it a uh, central executive calling it god same thing they could have called it the god in your head because that is the, the same function type of thing other cultures would have called it the god in their head so yeah that's a a good uh, similarity picked up there it, it makes me like feel like I have an even better argument for astrology now too because it's like the gestalt and the features and like it's always changing and it's not in any one place at any one time because the world's spinning the planets are spinning so you know my central executive is at least the universe <laughs> <laughs> the solar system the solar system anyway <laughs> it's funny you should say that is it funny I should say that I love it when you say it's funny I should say things <laughs> Because we're almost at the time for our final quote of the evening, right? Uh, or yes, I'm going to recap what the "What are we learning?" segment. Yeah. He says, "We, what are we learning? What we need to explain relevance realization." Um, and so this has something to do with goals. What I have written is constitutive goals help constitute it for being what it is. So it's like that whole thing about circular explanation because then he moves into this auto poetic part about self-organizing auto poetic entities have in them the programming for preserving that self-organization and this was like an argument for there being a deep connection between relevant realization and being a living thing because we're self-organizing and we're self-organized in a way that preserves the self-organization yes mm -hmm. so that's why that's what we are learning is the connection between relevance realization and being a living thing we, we will get to that next time i think when we talk of dynamical system theory i think that's the next episode okay because john um interprets dynamical system theory from an autopiotic seeing it autopiosis through that i think oh my god i haven't watched it in a while i shouldn't make see say these things but what stood out for me is just that the deep connection between doing relevance realizing and being a living thing like because it's i think it's about the preservation of life mm -hmm. something about that yeah that sparks because what is the source of this relevance realization? Um, everything else posits a source which is itself relevance realization, which we can't do because that's a circular. So we need to find something else, something in the brain or the mind that is not itself relevance realization. Mm -hmm. And 
then John says, which I didn't pick up quite honestly, like he was playing around, but and now that we went through it, I picked it up. He, because they speak of relevance and he speaks of relevance realization. And he's like, yeah, we can't really have a, a theory of relevance. And from other things that I've learned from him, it's because relevance is relative. Yeah. It changes, very much changes to the situation, the person, the everything influence yes. what is relevant so there's no one thing that is relevant so we can't have a theory of what is relevant right. but relevance realization and then i come back to what i started in the beginning all we ever needed was a theory of relevance realization and apparently how or why we do relevance realization will tell us something about our spirituality and our search for meaning mm and our love of wisdom for someone to be working three days a week but you have so much time to do philosophy and things that you the goal the goal is to be wise and so what is relevant in that situation isn't that i'm not getting into a bigger home you know because that's relevant for most people that aspire towards like in stage capitalism i'm sorry that aspire towards their goals <laughs> And how you are proving your worth by your things and your, you know, what what holds value in the structures around you as opposed to what holds value in your mind. And yeah, so what is relevant to me in who I aspire to be is philosophy. It doesn't matter that I drive a car that I've driven since it had 67,000 miles and now it has 250K and it's from 2007 and all the windows are crank windows and third gear doesn't work. None of that shit matters to me. I am not aspiring to have things. I am aspiring to wisdom. So what is relevant to me is going to be very different to other people that see me living with my grandparents and, you know, that doesn't look like success to them. To me, it feels great. And that's because that's what's relevant to me. My goals are different. Who you are shapes what you find relevant and what you find relevant shapes who you are. That is a circle. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> <the bottom. laughs> I think maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. Mm -mm. It's, but it's that reciprocal opening, I think, which is the opposite of, by the way, addiction, which is reciprocal narrowing, allowing you know, your loves to dictate to change your landscape, your sapiens landscape. It is so standard for something to start out as a good thing. The moment that you think that that thing is what gives it to you, it puts you into that toxic spiral of I'm not enough on my own. I need the thing to make me feel this way. I need the thing to put me back into that, to be creative, to be creative, to sleep. I just need it to, you know, all the things that I need it for. And it's like, no, once it becomes the thing that I need, to eat, then it's a problem. If my body cannot function in a proper way without the thing, it's a problem. It, I, my relevance of that thing has grown too much. It's, it's taking up too much space in relevant space. And then there's that whole thing about not tracking the changes. So mm. you just see the addiction and you're just tracking it mm. and you're like, I love that thing. I love it. I love it. Where's it going? Let me follow mm. it. And you're not and tracking you the changes. Realize how it's morphing into a demon. It's oh. becoming a parasite. Wow. We were well. We went actually all over the place in this. We went all the way back to the beginning of the awakening from the meaning crisis. We were like in every single open episode of the awakening from the meaning crisis. You even brought in the skeptic, like or the cynic, Diogenes. Uh, Diogenes, yeah. yeah, yeah. I agree. You ready to take us out? Yes. It's very short. So as I was telling you before, uh, my morning reading is Plato and my even, evening reading is uh, Plotinus. And uh, I'm not really going to read Plotinus himself. I'm still in the intro, which is Porphyry's uh, account of his life. And I'm not sure if we, well, we have to trust that. What he says is the last word of words of Plotinus is truly the last words of Plotinus. So I'm going to take us out with the last words of Plotinus. <sighs> Try to elevate the God within us to the divine 
in the universe.